Okay, guys, you, th this is who you came to listen to today. Oh, so I I'm hope really not. Happy that you're here. Well, hey, <laughs> that let me tell you what. This is <laughs> <laughs> well, if it if it if it makes you feel if it. <laughs> Two things. First of all, we are a CrowdStrike partner. I even wore my CrowdStrike socks tonight, so you too, if you go get some swag from them, can get your very obnoxious CrowdStrike <laughs> socks. Uh, I'm Michael McAndrews. I think probably most of you have probably heard me speak before. I've been in IT for a long, long time, 25 or so years. Done security for quite a while. Most notably, I was a special agent. Paul was my partner. I'm private sector now. Uh, our company, we go under the trade name now of Packet Watch. It's called WGM. And we do a lot of security stuff, a lot of incident response. I'm going to talk about a case tonight to kind of point out not only our partnership with CrowdStrike, this is not a commercial for Packet Watch or for CrowdStrike, but I want to show you a real life case. Now I've worked some more national security type cases. I have worked a, a couple of the Wicked uh, Panda came up for us, a few others, a little Wicked Spider popped in there. This particular case I'm going to talk about tonight is a straight up criminal case. There's no code word for it. There's nothing cool. You can make up your own if you want, but it's a straight up criminal case of some toll fraud and money and everything else, but it's more important that I demonstrate to you how we use these tools in the real world and what happens. In a lot of ways, this is going to be like a Quentin Tarantino movie, okay? There's going to be a lot of violence and a lot of weirdness, but at the end you're going to go, what really happened? I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, but we're going to go through it and I'm going to show you how we use these tools. An incident response happens, it's a fire drill. The phone rings, you have all kinds of things going on, unknown variables, I don't know what's happening. All I know is somebody needs my help. I start asking them, well, do you know what the heck happened? Do you have any logs? And they're always like, logs? What logs? Okay, that's what happens. At the FBI, we got that all the time. One interesting thing about the FBI, I'm sorry to bust the bubble here, Paul, but I'm gonna be honest with these folks, they did not like us touching the keyboard. The FBI, they don't like you touching the keyboard. The reason is if we do something to your network and something happens, then you're going to blame the FBI for it. So a lot of times what they want you to do is the word will be, do what's ever within your normal business practice. Well, if you knew your normal business practice, you probably wouldn't have called them in the first place, okay? But what's going to happen is they're going to say, give me logs, because we're all about the investigation. It's all about forensics. It's after the fact. So they're going to ask you for logs. So if you're going to call for help, whether it be an incident response or the government, law enforcement of some type, try to have some logs. Try to have something to go on. If you just call up and say, help, they're going to go, with what? Show me something, okay? They're not going to come in and sit down on the computer and start banging stuff out, okay? They're going to ask you for information so that they can provide help. Now, when somebody's attacking your company, they like to live off the land. They don't want to be seen. They don't. But when you're an incident response, you don't have to do that. When you're on incident response, you can bring your own tool set. When the fireman shows up to the fire, he doesn't ask you to borrow your garden hose, right? They're going to bring their own. They're going to bring their tools. And as an incident responder, you need to have your own toolbox and be ready. The other thing that's going to happen is this call is going to happen on a Friday afternoon. It's just the way it goes. Pretty much every week I get them on Friday afternoon. Now this week was a little different. I actually got it at about 8.30 Friday morning. But I also got one Saturday afternoon at about 4 o'clock. So if you average out, it was a Friday afternoon, but it was a two for this week. So they tend to come in on a Friday afternoon. Russian holidays notwithstanding, it's always on a Friday. So what do you need when you get that phone call? First thing you're going to have to do, you have to make a plan. What I recommend you do if you're an incident responder is you need to have a scoping call, probably multiple scoping calls. You need to talk to the person that's calling you and say, okay, why are you calling me? Tell me, what is it that you found that makes it interesting? Sometimes it's pretty blatant. Sometimes, you know what, I got a message on my screen that said you've been infected with ransomware and send a lot of Bitcoin to this address or you don't get anything back. Okay, that's a clue. Okay, we get that, right? But sometimes they'll just say, well, I don't know, so-and-so's computer was acting funny, or we're getting a lot of emails coming back saying that they can't take our messages because we're banned or something, or we're on a block list or something. Why are none of our emails going through? You want to ask them, what prompted your call? What makes you do this? This initiates the interview. Once you start interviewing them, you start to get a sense of things. Have your own toolbox and be ready to deploy so that when they're answering these questions, you're thinking to yourself, okay, this tool can help me with this. This can help me get more information. You're going to want to do that. Before you do anything, though, you're going to have to have a business person that has your statement of work available as well as your engagement letters, normally NDAs and other such things. You need to have these things ready to go. Make them templates, fill them out, and get those signatures. You're not just going to get on somebody's network without having a little bit of cover, right? Legal and everybody else wants you to make sure you know exactly what you're doing. My SOW will tell you, I'm going to come in and I'm going to deploy various tools onto your network. I'm going to investigate this incident. I will also give you an estimate of the number of hours as well as the price. Be very firm though, that is an estimate. It's only an estimate. It's my best guess based on my experience and training and what you've told me. 
and that comes into play later on and I'll show you why. And then the last part, probably the most important thing, you need resources. We need people to go do the work. You need a fireman to go out to the site and actually do something, okay? You have to have people. You could be have all of this other stuff ready to roll, but if you don't have personnel ready to deploy, then you're gonna be in a bind. If you're overworking your personnel, they're burned out on multiple assignments, that can be an issue. So most of the best companies out there have what we call a bench. You have a bench full of people, and you try to work to that magic number that your bench is completely engaged, okay, so you're making money, okay, but you also want a little bit of room there so you can always respond to the next piece of business that comes in. A lot of times incident response is a door opener. A lot of times it gets you into a company, helps you develop a relationship, and then you might lead to more business later on. So it's definitely something worth looking at. So, this particular case study, in the beginning, they called me. Turns out it's an international communications provider. It's an international telecommunications provider located in Latin America. They happen to specialize on emerging markets. Latin America is one of them. And they said, well, we're losing a lot of money every month because people are actually committing toll fraud by assigning lines that then get billed internationally to wrong customers. When we find them out, not only do we look bad to the customers and we have to fix that, but we lose the money and we're losing a lot of money. What we need is your help finding out where this is coming from. We think it's coming from inside the company and we just need your assistance to track down the IP address or the computers that are doing it. And I'm like, okay, so it's in the company, but we need to track down IPs. So do you have like multiple IPs and subnets and routers and all that good stuff? Nothing's too basic, you have to ask. They said yes. Yes, we have routers and we have IPs and we just don't know where this comes from. I said, okay, no, no problem at all. We, we, we think we can do this. So we have a couple of calls and we say, okay, give us some information. So the first, actually we had three scoping calls. They come in and they say, look, in this case we have roughly 150 customer service agents. Just 150. They take calls all the time. Of those, works, of those workstations, we also have maybe 50 that are servers. So 150 workstations, maybe 50 servers. And that's it. And our people take calls. Now, all the workstations are Windows 7 and higher. Our Linux servers run some of the applications. We have some Windows servers. Uh, we don't know exactly what everything is, but it's primarily Windows 7 workstations and you know, pretty much Windows servers with some Linux here and there. Now, the workstations are what you use to access the provisioning system. The provisioning system has a single username and password. Yes, we have a single username and password. Sure makes it easy. Right? But that way we can get in. Now, there's other systems that interface with the provisioning system and those are accessed with your Active Directory credentials. I'm like, okay, so you have an Active Directory domain. Absolutely. Wonderful. Okay. So when people access it with their AD credentials and you're able to say that somebody did something wrong, what happens? They go, well, we have found that people's accounts are being used and they're not even at work that day. Okay, that's a clue. I'll go with that. So what happens? They say, well, we shut down the account. Well, what do they do? Well, the bad actors just simply pivot over and use another account. Okay, okay. So as an incident responder, I'm thinking to myself, well, it's possible that they've compromised numerous accounts and they just pivot. Or a little bit of experience tells me here, we might be dealing with what we call a golden ticket. A golden ticket in the Active Directory world is when I compromise your Kerberos, uh, in effect, to keep it simple, I can impersonate pretty much anybody in the network at any time because I have the keys and I can get in and do anything I want. Once you get a golden ticket, you're in. So based on the fact that they're pivoting to multiple accounts pretty much at will, and they know that these accounts are getting shut down, so they know they've been found out, and apparently they don't care. That tells me we might be dealing with somebody having a golden ticket. And then finally they tell me, you know, we did hire one forensics group that came in and they looked at a couple machines and yeah, they, they, they found some malware. Oh, we've got a report from them. They found a little bit of malware on one of the computers. Okay, once again, that's something I want to know about. So based on the scoping call, I say, hey, let's make a plan. So here's what I'm going to do. First thing is, I need to go get those logs. I can't trust them to hand me all the logs, so I'm going to go get them. So CrowdStrike, for instance, has a great tool they call Falcon Forensic Collector, FFC. And we used a deployment tool to send FFC out to all of the devices, gather up all of the logs. Now, a beautiful thing about FFC is once it gathers all the information, it basically wipes itself off the computer. It's not a persistent mechanism, okay? So we can send it out to a bunch of devices, gather the logs, bring them back, and it goes away. However, for hosts, like workstations, I'm going to want to deploy an EDR solution, so I'm deploying something like the Falcon tool that actually goes and does stay on the computer. Now, the Falcon tool will perform functions where it's examining processes, looking at other things. It's, it will really help me do things. Um, but at this point, I'm just going, as I see at the bottom here, to observe. 
At this point, I just want to deploy it to get an idea of what I'm dealing with. So we're going to use FFC to get logs. We're going to put Falcon out there to keep an eye on all the workstations. And then I need to talk about network data. The reason I want to talk about network data in this presentation, the point of this is I'm trying to show you that you need everything. You need more than one thing. You need both. You need network and host-based. There are gaps on both sides. Neither tool will sufficiently cover your entire network. I happen to be a network guy. I'm into packets, and that's what I like to promote, but I know where my shortcomings are. I do a lot of host-based stuff, and as you'll see in here, there are shortcomings with that as well. So put them together, and you get a more comprehensive view. So the other thing I want to do is I want to assess the TTPs and the depth of the intrusion, maybe even get some attribution, and try to determine who done it. That's my plan. Well, you know what they say about the best laid plans, all right? If you believe everything that they just told you on that phone call and you walk in there, then you probably think Epstein killed himself too, right? Is that all right? Okay. So, here we go. What we found just after a day or two, first of all, workstations, 1,311, servers, 198, domain controllers, 4, NA, I don't even know what the hell that is, 1. Okay, that comes out. Where it breaks down to 760 Windows 10 machines, we got 480 Windows 7, and you can see the servers broken out there. Now, this doesn't give you the whole picture. By the end of this, we actually created duh, 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 more than 1,700 workstations in this Active Directory domain with more than 300 servers. Now, not, what's not reflected on some of those totals are the totals that I got from the uh, Falcon tool are operating systems that Falcon was supported on. Guess what? I found Windows XP in their environment. Mm -hmm. I found Windows Server 2003. I found several things like this. We can't even deploy our tools on these things. They had Red Hat Enterprise Linux 5.3, it's a 2010, it's a 2.6 kernel that we couldn't do anything with. It was one of the primary application servers. So this presents a challenge. Now we're starting to show where the gaps are. If you're doing with host-based only, I just created a huge blind spot here because I know that there's a lot of stuff on this network that I can't monitor right on the host. So already I'm looking at this going, whoo, okay, this network is a lot bigger. Now, you remember that SOW we sent? And I told you when I do that, it's an estimate of hours and the effort that it's going to take. And the reason is, I just don't know until I walk in there. And as you can see, what I expected to walk into versus what I found were two completely different things. They had no proxies. We had no application logs for the primary application that was the one being defrauded. I couldn't get on the box. I couldn't put host base protection on it because it was too old and not supported. And we found, as we go through this, we had a serious issue with the corporate culture. Now, I'll just say it was in Latin America, and this is not indicative of everywhere in Latin America, but this particular location, it's what you would call, politically correct, would be an emerging market, would be what some people would want to call it. Um, but however, it provided a real challenge for us because things don't get done there the way they get done here. Okay, Things are a little different there. You, you need to work with people in a different way down there, if you know what I'm saying, to try to get things to happen. So we found this was going to be a big issue as we go through it. So I told you earlier, the question was, do I want host base or do I want network? Normally, I jump on the network first. Normally, I'm a network guy. I want that network sensor. The reason I want that network sensor, we learned something at the FBI. When we do investigations, it's called the least intrusive method. We want to do what we can to be the least intrusive until we have a reason to go deeper and get that investigation. I don't want to show up at your house at 6 o'clock in the morning and kick the door in and tear the place apart until I have a really good reason. I'd sooner send off a subpoena and get a little information, maybe watch you from a distance. So I want to be less intrusive to your life and to the investigation. We're doing the same thing here. I don't want to go in there and tell the bad actors that I'm all over them yet. I want to be in less intrusive. So if I can get on the network and tap that internet egress point and see all the traffic going in and out, sooner or later they have to phone home. Unless they're using completely out-of-band communications, which believe it or not is not very common with this stuff, they're usually kind of noisy, then I'm going to see the traffic going in and out of the network. Now, in this case, I had to go the opposite. And the reason was those cultural issues that we just talked about a few minutes ago. Because they're located in a different country and I needed to send equipment down there, we had some challenges in order to get the equipment there. So, it was a lot easier for us to send the host base agent down and use deployment tools to get it to the Active Directory domain and deploy it out as much as we could. That was a lot easier than getting the network sensor down there. Now, eventually, and in the end result, I want both. So yes, I had to get a network sensor down there. And uh, 
you know, it took a little bit of time. Let's just say that. Uh, we, we sent it down there. We sent it by FedEx. It was quite an ordeal getting all the papers filled out and all the hoops we had to jump through. Uh, it was held up in customs down there. So eventually we paid the rents, I mean, um, taxes. <laughs> and the server was released. Uh, it was received. And on day two, we were told that it was abandoned. We're like, it's not abandoned. It just got there. And they're like, oh, we show it's abandoned. I'm, no, get it out of Pablo's truck, put it back on the cart. It needs to go. Well, fortunately, the company that we worked with had a lot of pool down there. They made a few clone calls. And after we paid the um, taxes, then the... Um, the server was released and was eventually sent to the customer and put on the network. And it proved to be invaluable, and I'll show you why. So, in this case, we went host base first. I showed you a little slide a minute ago that said how we had a lot more workstations than expected, and I found some other devices. Here's one of the ways I knew it. As soon as I got the host base stuff out there, this is a screenshot from Falcon. In this, I'm actually looking at a particular host, and it tells me there are three managed neighbors. These are neighbors that are also running Falcon. And it says, hey, yes, these are three of my neighbors, and I know them, I've met them, and everything's good. But there are, and if you'll notice, multiple pages of machines that are on my subnet that I'm listening to speaking that are not managed. So after they deployed to the 1900 things, they told me, they said, nope, we're deployed, everybody's got it. I go in and I start looking, and I go, oh, really, you're completely deployed? Well, look at all of these machines that are unmanaged. Now, what on your network might be unmanaged? What might I see that's unmanaged? Somebody throw me something. Printers. Printers. Excellent. Printers are a big source of that right there. Rogue machines that people throw on. People bring on phones and stuff like that. Okay, We don't put Falcon on phones. Okay, I'm seeing devices on the network that are unmanaged that I'm looking at trying to say, okay, what is this? Why are they there? What's going on? So this really helped me get a better idea on what the network looked like and how good their management was, or lack of in this case, to know exactly what they had, okay? So we're trying to help them. I'm not condemning them, I'm not talking bad about them. I'm there to help them, I'm their partner. So I'm going back and saying, okay, we're finding these machines. This is how we located some of the XP machines. We were able to see operating systems and other things and I'm able to say, hey, wait a second, we have something here and they said, oh yeah, we didn't know those were there. Great, we're helping you. Can we do something to get those off the network? So that's what we started doing. So once I started getting some machines though, I started getting some hits. Falcon comes back to me and says, hey, I got something here. This is an alert. This is an example of one of the alerts that traces the process tree, and it comes down, and it ends with a cmd.exe. So it runs right down there, launches cmd.exe, and you see a bunch of code. Here's a closer look at the code. PowerShell. We just talked about PowerShell, right? This is a great thing. Well, we're not going to deobfuscate all of this business right now, but it's pretty simple. If you start looking through here, you're going to see some things that you can read. I see IP addresses right here. I see a domain, 1217BYE.host. Remember that one, for example. So that's a simple domain. There's some more IP addresses. There's three or four. Now I've got IOCs. Now I know this is on the network, and I've got indicators that I can go out and do some searching. Now. In all, in all honesty, Falcon does a lot of this work for you. They use their threat intelligence feeds, and if they know about it, they'll come back and they'll say, hey, we can kind of tell you what this is. If not, as with anything, Google is your friend. You go out there and start looking this up. We found out very quickly these are coin miners. What these are is they are downloading coin miners to the browser, and people are exploiting them, and they're mining an awful lot of coins. Now, on a side note, we also found activity on some of their routers that indicated coin mining activity. I looked into them a little bit and they happened to be MicroTik routers. Sure enough, I go out there and I found an exploit for that version of MicroTik that turned them into coin miners. So unfortunately for these folks, even their routers were mining coins for the bad guys out there. So people were trying to make money off of them. But this is more or less low-hanging fruit. This isn't what was costing them toll fraud. This isn't what the point of the investigation, but it started tr it's showing me some things. So I started digging a little deeper and this is when it starts to get interesting. When log on, user init, explore, servicehost.exe. Now, in this case, one thing you'll notice is the global or the local prevalence of this particular thing is pretty common. But the global prevalence is unique. What we're doing here is we're leveraging CrowdStrike's threat intelligence platform to say, have you seen this anywhere else? Have you seen these kind of things occurring? And it's telling you right here, hey, what you got going on here is a little unique globally, but locally it's happening quite a bit. So I go up and I start looking at it and I go, what's the problem? Well, what we noticed was service host was launched not from Windows. If you see service host EXE being launched and it doesn't come from the Windows folder, that would be a clue. 
Okay, you want to look into that. In this case, it was being launched from Program Files x86 Cisco Systems VPN client. They didn't use Cisco VPN. They didn't do anything, but that's where it was launching from, and it's service host.exe. So we take the executable, we take the SHA, we take a few other things, we start looking into it. Thanks to a little bit of Google Foo and to CrowdStrike, we found out pretty quick this was Quasar Rat. Quasar Rat was definitely running on these machines. So now we found some real malware. Now we found something that's coming in. But again, I've got IOCs. So I start looking at this, we go out to the host and we actually pull out service host EXE so we can run it through. We put it into hybrid analysis and a few other things and we come back and we find connections, we find ports, we find things that this thing is trying to do. Again, I now have IOCs. Okay, that's great. I can pull up that particular host that launched it and I can see there's their IPs, that's what they did, but they've done it multiple times. Now I'm starting to get a timeline. I can tell you this is happening over and over and over out there. Okay? So here's the problem with all this. I've now got a host that we definitely found malware on. It's definitely doing something bad. We've managed it, so thank goodness Falcon is now able to stop it. Once we go into preventative mode instead of just observation mode, I can actually kill this process. That will stop it from happening. But remember all those unmanaged neighbors out there? I can't do that because maybe they don't support the tool or something else, so I have to have a different mechanism in order to do it. So we are clearly not seeing everything at this point. With host-based, we're clearly not getting the whole picture because I can tell you there's other things out there. We have some good IOCs that we want to go on, but I desperately needed network coverage. Desperately needed it. So we did get the server sent down there. It did finally make it through the hurdles. It got put on the network, and within moments, we started getting signature-based alerts. Now, when I get IOCs for something like this, I write my own signatures. Even if there's one already out there for it, I tend to write my own signature because then I know exactly what's triggering it, okay? So, one of the first things I did, even though it's low-hanging fruit, is I wrote a signature for that 1217BYE.host domain. This was within the first few minutes of getting on their network, and I can tell you yellow means bad in this case, okay? I know it's hard to see, but right down here, you'll actually see right up here, where's it at, 1217, it's on here. I can't even read it from here. Oh, here it is right here. Detected coin miner domain 1217BYE.host that was used on this particular operation. And in this case, I put that out there, and we had 1,669 hits pretty darn quick coming from multiple hosts over there on it, okay? That lets me see exactly who's doing it. But again, this is coin miner. Well, in addition to the coin miner, all of a sudden I start getting hits for Neutrino Bot. Here's some more coin miner. Here's PowerShell downloaded with Mimi Cats. Anybody heard of that? Remember I talked about that golden ticket earlier? That would be a clue for that as well. Mimi Cats will do things like that for you. It helps you get in there, okay? More PowerShell coming down. And we've got everything from, you know, attempted worms and some DNS responses and other things. All kinds of stuff. Here's another, uh, another backdoor check-in that was recognized. Now, notice all of these alerts that I'm seeing on the network. And I only got a few things with Falcon. Why? Not Falcon's fault, because I couldn't be managed on a lot of those devices. Those printers, those routers. I'm seeing the coin miner stuff coming from the routers. I couldn't see it on the Windows XP machines. I couldn't even see it on the main application server. Okay, so in the network world, one of the biggest gaps that we have is encryption. I can't see inside that encrypted traffic unless I do a man in the middle, and I really don't want to do that. It's computationally expensive. It also puts me in a position where if something breaks, who are you going to blame, right? So I don't tend to like to be in the middle, but I can see two people have a conversation at the side of this, off, at the side of this room every day, and they do it at the same time. I may not know what they're saying, but I recognize the pattern. And then I might even watch and see where they go. And I see them meet somewhere else. This is all intel. So just by observing the packets on your network and the traffic, I can find things such as beacons. This is one of the things we look for with our tool quite a bit. We look for beacons. Who's talking to something outside of your network on a very regular basis that's not human initiated? Typically, if it's a beacon, it's going to be very precise. They do a, few, a little bit of jitter here and there on the comms, but I'm looking for those beacons going out of your network, making those communications. I may not know what you're saying, but I'm going to recognize it, and then that's going to allow me to focus on you where I then employ something like a host-based tool that gets in there, and it does give me that data like you saw, where I can see the process, the SHA, exactly what's happening, and if we want to, we can stop it. 
So for me, I can look at the network and then drill down. In this case, we had to start looking at the host and then go up. But once I got up, I'm taking the big view, now I have a whole lot more hosts that I'm going to be looking at. Now I can come through and go to the client and say, look, you've got a lot of other IPs that are doing some really bad things too. And I'm not going to focus on the, the low-hanging fruit. I'm not going to focus on the coin miners. But I'm definitely going to go focus on the neutrino bot and things like that. And hey, just for fun, this one caught my eye. I even found an eternal blue coming from Metasploit Framework launching on their network. So when I start seeing alerts like this, that somebody's doing Metasploit on your network, that's also where I'm going to start looking. We really wanted to get attribution and try to tell them who was doing this. So we're trying to focus on that, and we're trying to stop the losses from their main thing. More of these, you can see more check-ins, more alerts coming here. Uh, Floki bot, C2 IPs were being used. We had all kinds of stuff here. You take your pick. Honestly, I kind of joked with somebody one time and said, if I can find something that's not compromised on the network, that's a win. Um, it was, uh, they have a lot, unfortunately, they're up against a hurdle. Now, for something like the uh, domains, they had a particular domain that was being used for command and control. That domain, they would rotate the IPs a little bit. But once I identify the method of communication, I could then go in and I look at packets. So now I can go in and I can say, okay, who else is doing this communication? Who else are making these same things? Who else is meeting in the corner of this room every day and then walking back to the same location? So what I was able to do was take those IOCs and create a query. Now, on my particular appliance, Packet Watch, I capture every single packet on your network. Everything. And then I catalog it. Now, it may be encrypted, but I'm still seeing the connections going through. On the things that aren't encrypted, I can expand it and see everything in the complete packet. But if you're doing a lookup to a domain, I see the DNS query, and then eventually I see the connection going out. So in this case, thanks to the host-based tool, I knew what the service host EXE was the culprit, and we examined it, and I knew the domains and some of the IPs it was looking at. So what I found kind of interesting on this one is I go pull it out, and I see it connecting, and it's actually using port 5938. Anybody in here know that port? Anyone? One of the things I get kind of big on when we look at this are desktop sharing applications. And this particular one happens to be TeamViewer. They were using TeamViewer. I've worked several intrusions where TeamViewer was involved. Not through any fault of TeamViewer, usually because the people using TeamViewer had their accounts compromised and bad actors used them to access the network. I tell people, if you need access to your network, please use a VPN, use two-factor authentication. Thanks for bringing that up earlier. Let them come in in an authenticated fashion, then they can connect. And sure, RDP for everyone. What the heck? Why not, right? <laughs> so here we go. So in this particular case, they were hiding under port 5938 because this company uses TeamViewer quite often. So it was really difficult at first to distinguish the TeamViewer traffic from the CNC traffic. Now, the C2 traffic that I found did a couple things different. First of all, they were sending out beacons using ACK packets. They weren't doing a send packet and followed by a send ACK and ACK. They were actually just sending crafted ACK packets out. And that was the way they were beaconing out to the IP that they were going to to let them know they were there. The other thing was I noticed the window size was a little bit different and things like that. But then at the most basic level, I just excluded all of the team viewer IPs. Took me a little bit of time to do that. But once I created this query, I could say, show me everything on port 59, that the destination port was 5938 and didn't go to team viewer. And I could go bingo and voila, here you go. Beacon, 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 beacon. Activity right down there. Now, the customer would call me up and they'd say, hey, Michael, we saw some activity yesterday. I'd be like, really? When did you see it? And they said, sometime between midnight and, you know, sometime in the morning, we saw activity. I would put my query in, I would run it, and I'd say, well, let me guess. Did it happen sometime around 1 a.m.? And went all the way down here until about 5 p.m. in the afternoon. They were doing, yeah, as a matter of fact, it did. And I said, there you go. Now I've got confirmation that not only have I identified the traffic, but I know exactly which tool was doing it and I know which machines were doing it. So now I go into my machine, I simply right click on the source IP and say give me a distinct count of source IP. By the way, go ahead and give me a distinct count of destination IPs and countries and tell me who's responsible for this. The destination were two VPN IPs in France in this particular instance. But more importantly, now I've also got internal host. Now, we know that if they were running Falcon and I had prevention turned on, which I did by this time, I was killing it on the host that I knew about. So obviously, these hosts right here were not running it. So I'd go back to the customer and I'd say, okay, we need to deploy this onto these tools. And they go, yeah, we can't seem to reach it. So they were unmanaged assets. So once again, we're kind of illuminating the network and giving them 
giving them homework, unfortunately. They had to go do it, but um, I wasn't going to, to that particular country. I almost said it. Um, <laughs> um, yes. Yes. So you mentioned your capture mode packets. How many taps would you, do you need on a network, and then what's your interface to those switch packets? Great question. So I mentioned I'm capturing all the packets. How many taps do I need? What's my interface? In this particular instance, we had two captures. The first capture was a tap at the internet gateway. They had a single internet gateway, so that was easy. We, it was, uh, I don't know, not even a full gig for this particular company, if I remember correctly. But we, of course, can do 10 gig pretty easily. Uh, we can do fibers. I think 50 gig fiber now, and now the bigger ones are. We've got interfaces. So I haven't had to go that big yet. Most people are gig or so. Um, but I can process on my system. I've processed upwards of 500,000 packets a second uh, without ever dropping a single packet. Uh, I can process them and catalog them and put them in with no problem. Uh, most of my back end, I'll be honest with you, it's elastic. Uh, I'm very transparent. I'll tell people I'm a big, we're an elastic shop. I'm a big believer. We're partners with them. I do a lot of work with it. It's great. So I scale out. If your network is what I would call a small to medium sized business, one of my appliances jumps on, no problem. 50,000 packets a second, no problem. That covers most people. But if you're larger, I can scale out, and I have customers that I have to do that, and we put a lot of them. So we just fit it to fit you, but yeah, we capture everything. So great question. Now in this case, we've got some internal IPs that were uh, obviously doing bad things. They were beaconing out to the CNC, and now I'm of interest because I want to go to the customer and I want to say, hey, we need to work on trying to get these fixed and get them to stop. The top one I looked at and said, that's probably a router. And guess what? It, it was actually a domain controller. So, yeah. Yeah, that was a domain controller. Um, you know, a lot of DNS entries were going through there and stuff like that. So I knew that was bad news. And I, 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 anyway, so I said, let's just take the second one. Let's go to number 119, 151.25. Let's go take a look at that. Now, I don't believe it's covered. Otherwise, we'd be stopping it with our host based tool, right? So what I do is I go in back into my Falcon tool. So now what I've done is I've started at the host, I've gone up to the network. I've taken my IOCs and I've now illuminated people below me at the host level that are doing things wrong. So now I'm coming back down. So now I take that IP address and I put it into Falcon and I say, has anybody seen this IP address? And in this particular instance, they said, yes, there were two computer names that had seen it. 90% of the time, this computer had seen it, had seen that IP, that 151.25 I'm looking for. So I go into that computer and I say, can you tell me what you saw there? And it pulls up and it says, yes, this is my computer, but by the way, it was in my neighbor's list. In my neighbor's list, there's an IP address, a MAC address, and even more importantly, now I have a computer name. It saw that and it grabbed a computer name and I can go back to the customer and say, not only can I give you an IP address, I can give you a computer name and I can tell you it's on the same segment as this computer which is managed. So this is the flow. This is the how we do it. We just keep working the problem and working the problem and trying to find the problem, trying to find what we can. But in the meantime, I've got to try to mitigate this thing. Hopefully we can eradicate it. So that's what we ended up trying to do. Now, I can tell you before that some of the domains that they were using, that they were alternating IPs on that covert traffic, I mentioned that we had some cultural issues. Numerous times I asked them, numerous times I asked them, can we please sinkhole that domain? I said, well, just go to the DNS. Just put that domain in your doggone DNS and send it to nowhere land. That way, if they want to rotate IPs, they've got to choose a whole different domain. Let's just stop it. And I'll tell you if anybody's trying to go outside your DNS, but right now, these queries are going to your DNS. They are. There was a different uh, piece of malware that was in their network that was using a different DNS, and I identified that, and I also said, hey, let, why don't we block that one as well? But I don't like to chase IP addresses. I, I don't mind chasing a domain, because then they've got to go register it, maybe give me some other indicators, maybe we find some attribution because they're using the same registrar, or the same name, or something like that. So if they have to pivot domains, I'm okay. I just don't want to chase IP addresses all day long. So I asked them repeatedly, please, let's go sync all this. Unfortunately, those requests were unanswered. Okay. I believe that the security folks we were working with were really well intended and really tried to get it done. I know that they put the request in, they used their ticketing system and put the request in, but for some reason, it just didn't get done. I understand the CISO even called down there and said, I need this to happen, and it still never got done. So I can only do so much from here, and I'm trying to give them means to mitigate it. So in the end, what happened with this particular incident, the combination of network tools and host based tools gave us excellent visibility. I was able to not only find out what tool was being used and what was happening to cause the fraud, how they were getting in to do the fraud, 
give them the times and back it up with evidence to even show it. There were a few extra pieces I'm not throwing in there. I did find a particular username that was logging into machines multiple times and trying to do some things they probably shouldn't have been doing. The forensic collector gave me some logs that they logged into other things over a period of time. So I understand they took that information and interviewed that particular employee. I never found out what happened. Um, in America, we would probably know it'd be public, but here, um, I don't know. In these particular countries, I don't know. I just don't know what happened. I don't know if they conducted the interview, if law enforcement did it, I just can't tell you. But uh, I never got a feedback on that one. But we got complete visibility. We did find a potential suspect or two. Uh, the corporate culture, as I mentioned, uh, inhibited it. We had at least six workstations fully compromised with Quasar RAT, and we're doing some of the really bad stuff. The primary application server had no less than three back doors on it. Um, that thing was a Linux-based system and was completely owned. Interesting note, though, the second tap that I had in addition to the internet was we put a network tap right on the server segment. I said, please give me that, because I couldn't get to the log files on the application server. Please give me a tap on the server segment so I can see if anybody's going to and from it. I was looking for those back doors. I knew the ports. They never used them. They never used those back doors. Why? They didn't need to. They had credentials, and they could go right through the front door with that single username and password, and they never had to even use the back door to get to the system. They were just using stolen credentials or possibly uh, golden ticket credentials and just going right in through the front door and committing this fraud at will. At will. We tried to sink all the bad domain. The host base actions stopped all the ones that we could put it on, but I told people that's like a screen door on a submarine. You're still going down, okay? If we stopped it on four or five machines, that's great, but we still had plenty of machines that were compromised that we could never get protection on and until they upgraded them to supported operating systems. Right. So, so the key takeaways from this thing are the host base is great when you can see everything, but can you really see everything? They told me 150 workstations and 50 servers. Once I got on there, it was obvious I couldn't see everything with just host-based. I couldn't see what the printers were doing and such. I could see they were there, but I couldn't get that. So the network stuff helped. The network, I already told you, the encryption can be a challenge. Host-based really gets around that. Pick your battles, though. I had so many issues, but I had to ask myself, what's costing this company money? Are the coin miners really costing them money? Yes, no, it's something that I definitely wouldn't want on my network, but I wasn't going to spend my cycles fighting coin miners when I'm trying to find those rats and I'm trying to find what was really costing them money at their application level. And then the next step would have been there was a tool, um, I'll just say it, it's Observe It. We work with them. I wanted to deploy Observe It, put it on some of these workstations that were suspect, and that way we could actually get screenshots, keystrokes, and maybe even use their camera to take a picture of the user that was out there to try to find out who was actually doing it. If somebody's account was being used and they said, no, that wasn't mine, I had enough evidence to show that it's likely that the account was stolen. It may not have been that user, but if we get their picture at the keyboard while it happens, that was going to get me around that. Unfortunately, with this particular case, we ran out of hours and uh, attention, I guess we should say. They kind of, they just, I don't know what they're going to do. We've told them there's not much they can do except for uh, really update the operating system. So I wish I had a great big finale for you and a great big whodunit, you know, do the Scooby-Doo ending and all that good stuff, but we don't have that this time. We just kind of left it out there. And then having our own toolbox allowed us to work very quickly and efficiently, though, we were able to deploy and answer a lot of questions very quickly. If I'd gone off what they'd given me and their tools, we would have never been there. So having that toolbox really helped. So as you can tell, I wanted to kind of get through this tonight. I wasn't going to keep you guys terribly long. I aimed for about 35, 40 minutes on this deal, but I wanted to leave time for some questions. So with that said, any questions on anything I talked about tonight on using the tools, topics, or quite frankly, if you all know me, you can ask me anything, and I'll, get, I'll find out for you. Yes, sir? How many hours? We started on this one with a 200-hour block. And we ate them all up, and we're, we're where we kind of left off, and they weren't ready to go more. Did you get paid? Yes. Uh, however, I will tell you, our server is still there, and we are taking bets around the office as whether or not that server ever makes it home. I don't know. I wouldn't plug it in. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm just curious if it makes it home or not. Uh, if not, they're going to get a bill. But, yes, ma'am. Uh, that would be from experience and training, particularly from my prior uh, job. I can tell you that uh, gangs are the new organized crime. Gangs make money any which way they can. We find that there's pervasive gangs and such down there making money on these things because they go out on the streets. Yeah, they can sell drugs, they can do prostitution, they can do the traditional stuff you've heard about, but we also know from some cases I've worked, especially in foreign countries, I can sell calling cards 
or I can sell access to phone home to your relatives or have them call you and that's worth a lot of money because you don't necessarily from some of these countries get included in your local domestic plan kind of rates. Some of these countries being emerging markets, you still have to pay a lot of money. So if somebody down there without a lot of money can pay somebody 10 US dollars and they can phone home for a whole month or whatnot and talk to their loved ones, they'll do it. And the people that are profiting on that are not the telecommunication provider. We've seen that in several cases. Um, and I, I've dealt with some, I personally worked a case dealing with another part of the world where calling cards was a huge money maker that funded that particular organization. And uh, it tends to be, again, it depends on their motive. So the only, let me say that I have a slide. The only difference between national security and criminal is the motivation. The tools are the same. The tactics are the same. It's just the motivation. If they're just out to make money, it's one thing. If they want to do espionage or, or promote their agenda, that's usually the other. Yeah, Paul, go for it. So when I see something like this, I'm looking at it going, all right, I see what's going on here. They're making a lot of money, and they're well-funded. This wasn't some kid with a computer in the backwoods of the country doing it. They knew exactly what they were doing. I still believe it was an insider job or a vendor. Um, I believe the vendor may have had something because the particular provisioning system that they were using is fairly specific. This isn't something you just Google and pull a manual down. Uh, they knew exactly what they were doing. And when steps were taken to kick them out, they knew exactly how to circumvent those procedures. So they, they had inside knowledge. Yes, sir? No, were business operations affected? Actually, no, they, they wanted them to stay up. So interestingly enough, we were concerned about ransomware. And they never ransomware them because then they couldn't sell any minutes to their customers, right? So they didn't want the network to go down. They actually wanted to keep the network up. So business operations were unaffected uh, during all of this. And I was worried about ransomware, but they never took them down because they were making too much money, I'm sure. Oh, what kind of training would I recommend for incident response? To be honest with you, uh, frontline support and just get thrown in the fire. Uh, there's no better training than experience. Um, I started on a help desk. Um, I loved it. Um, I did all kinds of stuff. Uh, I've done this for a long time, and I'm still learning. And the main way that I learn is not sitting there listening to somebody like me talk. You might get some ideas, and you might see something that the next time you experience it, it'll come back on you. But when you sit there and live it, that's the best way. So get involved with people that do it. Um, Test it a little bit yourself if you need to, but get involved with people that do incident response. Um, documentation, we're geeks, right? So we don't always document things. But if you're doing incident response and you might end up in court, you're gonna learn to follow those steps. Document what you're doing, learn about it. And then the next time it happens, you can refer right back to that documentation and say, oh yeah, I remember that. I absolutely remember that. I also do a lot of threat sharing. I'm a big proponent of the MISP system, M-I-S-P. Uh, we're working with a lot of people here in Arizona with that right now. We put in these kind of indicators and that way when I put them in, we share them with other people. My systems pull from MISP every few hours and I pull something in. So if I put a new indicator in there or somebody in Belgium puts an indicator in from something that happens, within two hours, my system is looking for it. And that's the sharing and that helps us all get better. I'm gonna share with them and they're gonna share with me and then I'm looking for those IOCs. Any more? Are we good? Love it. Thank you all so much for your time tonight. I really appreciate it. Thank you.